Tell you what, let's do this. Sorry, Facebook Live. They're like, I didn't hear anything that they either of them said. We're going to fix that real quick, and I'm going to make you guys redo this thing. So if you could read yours, and then, Brian, if you could read yours again. Okay, so out of the passion, it says, when there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. Hmm. The revelation of the word. Obviously, let's real quick talk about that before we move on, Brian. The word is, is in twofold. Obviously, this is the word. This is the, the rule brick given to us. But also with that, and hear me right in this before you judge me, the Holy Spirit is also the word. So, but this is the thing. This is the coolest part. If anything the Holy Spirit says contradicts this, it's not the Holy Spirit. Make sense? Yeah. So the word of God, the written word of God is our rule brick. It's our foundational basis that we run everything else against. If it comes across scripture and it aligns with scripture, it, 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 it does not contradict scripture and it is a god breathed thing, then I would say that is the rhema word of God. Now with that, that doesn't mean I write it down and say, thus saith the Lord, it's now part of the Bible. No, 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 wait a second. That's not the case. But I'll be honest with you. I have read things that man have written that I can sit there and say, I believe that was God breathed. I believe God inspired them to write that. Does that mean that they wrote part of the word? No, absolutely not. That just means they were listening to the Holy Spirit and wrote down what he told them to write down. So the word of God is our rule break. This is not changing, you guys. It can't change. Because if this changes, how many people here think we should be able to change our constitution? Good. Thank you, Jesus. Um, why our founding fathers wrote the constitution is because they had foresight to say someday this, this, this authored, uh, document by men seeking the face of God, this document will come under attack because there will be an opportunity in this nation for us to lose our moral compass and to walk away. And I can, we can argue all day long about the, the faith of the founding fathers. There were some super godly men. There were some mixed up men too. But I will say this, there were some men with amazing morals. Yeah. I can say that with confidence. Why are we sitting there saying we will not change the constitution? Because we can't change that which our foundation of our country is based upon. The moment, and I will say this prophetically, the moment we open up the constitution for revision, we will see the greatness of America be no more. Because, because we will step out of that which originally was designed. And so as a church, the moment we step away from the word in any way, we will lose the foundation of the church. And so in this process, and we'll talk about this a lot more tonight, the word is going to be the, the foundation and we will take and bounce everything back off of the word. So if you come tonight, bring your Bible. If you come tonight, bring your knowledge. Because if it's a deal where we're going to actually write down what's going on in our church, write down what we do, and we're going to say, wait a second, that's not in the word. Not saying it's not bad, but it's not in the word. Okay, put that in this column. That is in the word. We have to do that. Put that in this column. And we will actually start seeing and understanding the heart of our Father in regards to the church. So thank you. You've got it. If you want to read yours, that again, we're in Proverbs 29, 18. And what translation are you reading out of, Brian? I don't know. <laughs> My Bible. I don't His know own? It It'll say right here. There. New international version. Okay. Yep. You're in. Right. Yep. So, new international version. Right. The newer international version is what he's honestly. It's there's. I'm in the old internet new international version, and he's in the new new international version. <laughs> well, I'm being serious, guys. This is a new re reversion revision. So. My Bible's a little older. Okay. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom instruction. Mm. Who heeds wisdom's instruction. How many people here would rather have knowledge or wisdom? I'll take wisdom. Okay. So this is it. Have you ever met someone who's very knowledgeable but not wise? Yes. Okay. Just a few. What? Just a few. Every once in a while. Okay, so there is one common denominator that you can find in every growing church, regardless of its denomination, nationality, and size. You want to know what it is? The common denominator is a leadership 
and a leadership group that is not afraid to believe God at his word and follow it. It doesn't matter what the denomination is. This is, uh, this is actually stuff that has been brought forward by Rick Warren as he's done research on churches. And you might be like, oh, I don't agree with Rick Warren. That's not what we're talking about right now, and you can disagree with him all you want. But the truth is, as they're doing statistical proof of church growth in America, church growth around the country, the only common denominator is a leadership of a church that is not afraid to believe God at his word and follow it. That's it. I mean, and, they, and I, you should read the whole, the whole deal. It's amazing. They actually went into all of the things that churches have tried that have failed. I'm going to tell you right now, you could be the most trendy church in the world, but if you're not following the ways of God, it will not grow. You may put seats, you may put butts in seats, but you will never put people into the kingdom of God. Ooh, yeah. And you've seen it. I mean, and, I, and I'm not going to name names and I'm not here to be mean, but there are churches today that will take and they will go just like this. We don't really need that because that's offensive in today's. So let's just tell you what you want to hear so that you can feel better about yourself. And we really don't need the word of God anymore because, uh, because that's offensive. Well, you want to know something? The word of God is incredibly offensive to someone running from the word of God. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not here to belittle anyone, but I am going to say that if the word of God is offensive to you, that's probably because you've been running from the Holy Spirit so long and you've turned a deaf ear so long to the heart of God that you no longer can hear it as truth. You hear it as condemnation. So the word of God is that basis, that common denominator. Nothing starts happening until somebody starts dreaming. Say it again. Nothing will start happening until someone starts dreaming. Maybe you've heard me say this, the dream that is impact. There's 15 people in the basement of a church, not back up, 15 people in the basement of a house. And they said, you know, you know what, if, what if we could build church a little differently? We didn't have a clue what we were saying. We didn't have a clue what we were getting into. Uh, we started moving down a, a road, and, and that built into another room and in another place and in another facility, and finally we ended up here renting and then started getting more and re- renovating, and, and everyone who helped with that understands clearly and has spent the time, hours, and calluses in this place. Um, but I always, in the back of my mind, had this nagging thing that said, we have not fully understood that which God intended to do. We're there. Our heart's there. We desire it. But there's a big difference between desire and dream. So let me just real quick throw something out there as we get into this. And we'll talk more about dreaming. But let me just just give a tidbit, a teaser. What would happen if the gospel of Jesus Christ had a vehicle by which it could be brought forward that the lost are found? that those who have never been exposed or never even been opened up to the gospel of Jesus Christ are opened up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this is one thing you need to understand through this entire process. The gospel's not broken. Let me say that again, because I only think like three people in here heard that. The gospel isn't broken. Why do I say that? Because a, a lot of churches have replaced the gospel with something else, thinking that's the problem. Oh, we talk about it every once in a while. We want people to get saved. Well, I don't see fruit of that in your ministry. I mean, I actually, it was interesting. I I was able to sit down with an individual who was part of a, a, a church, and this individual said, I went to this church, and I was a part of the leadership of this church, and in that place of leadership, I never once heard the gospel of Jesus Christ brought forward. The good news wasn't going forward. Why? Because it, it's, it's not popular. Okay, so somebody start dreaming. Dreams are where it's at, you guys. How many people here have ever had a God dream that you sit there and go, wow, that was cool. And I'm, and, and I'm not, and hear me, dreaming can be awake or sleeping. Mm-hmm. Get that? Uh, dreaming, there's actual sleeping dreams. God can give you something in that type of dream, and that's cool. And, and I'm not discounting that, but I'm actually here talking about, hey, guess what? Do you, could, what would happen if this happened? Could you imagine what it would look like if the church did that? What if the church left its walls? What if the church did something different? That's dreaming. Alex, if you could turn the AC on. I see people that are overheating, me included. <laughs> 
So it starts with a dream, which becomes a vision. The vision then becomes the goal. If you don't have a goal for your church, your default goal is to remain the same. Let me say it again. If you do not, if we do not have a goal for our church, the default goal will be to remain the same. Anyone ever? Right? Let's just be very honest with you. I'm amazed at this law of physics that I'm going to explain. An object that is in motion tends to stay in motion until what? Acted upon by an outside force. An object that is at rest tends to stay at rest until acted upon by what? An outside force. The church is an object that tends to stay at rest until acted upon by the Holy Spirit and gets it moving. But this is the problem. When you quit seeking the face of God, you will automatically go back to a place of rest. And I'm not talking about the good rest. I'm not talking about resting in God. I'm talking about doing nothing. I uh, had a conversation with a board member of a church this last weekend, and he made the comment, he said, 10 years of this church being stuck. He says, 10 years of stuck. And he says, now my question is this, do you think the rusty old cogs of this church are capable of moving again? Well, it's gonna, you want to know what it's going to do? It's going to knock some stuff off. Always does. So the thing that I found interesting as I looked into more statistics, most people coming to the kingdom of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ are coming in churches that are five years or less in age. It's like 87%. So any church over the age of five falls into a new category that states you're less likely to reach the lost due to the nature of your vision and mission. New churches have an attitude of, if we don't, it won't. If we don't go out there, it won't grow. If we don't go out there and shine the light of Jesus, it won't go forward. Old churches stuck in their way say this, if we do, what then? If we do that, what will actually happen? It's a lot easier to stay a a church of 150 than it is to be a church of 5,000, guys. Let's just stay comfortable in our paid for building. Why don't, we just, why don't we just understand that there's people getting blessed here? Do you see the difference? The difference is, guess what? No option, we must. And so those rusty cogs of the church need to start turning again. And the thing that you really need to understand, you're like, Jeremy's talking about changing the whole church. This is what we're really going back to. I want to boil off all the fat of the church and get back to the meat of the church and understand that God designed and built us a structure right here that desperately is needed to be heard. It works. The thing, and I made this comment the other day, and I ruffled a lot of pastor's feathers at a a meeting I was in, and I said, guess what? I don't want an Acts 2 church. And they go, what? I said, that's 2,000 years old. You don't think God can do better than that now? I want the principles and fundamentals of an Acts 2 church in the 21st century that's culturally relevant to this next generation that desperately needs to hear the gospel, that is incredibly open to the gospel and is saying, give me something real. I don't want your fake. So if we don't have our goal, our default goal is to remain the same. If you aim at nothing, you're definitely going to hit it. You can take that one to the bank. Uh, I do do some long-range shooting. I I like shooting, period. Um, My stress relief is to ring steel to go out and shoot prairie dogs to do that type of stuff. And and there's people right now going, is that godly? Yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is. But I make a joke all the time, and I ask people this question. I'm like, guess how many inches of bullet drop I have at 800 yards on my 7-millimeter my mag that's, that's loaded hot? And a lot of people go, oh, 6, 8, 10, 15. I mean, I get all sorts of different things. And whenever you're like, well, it's only like 200 inches, and they go, what? <laughs> right? But a lot of times I think the church has done that. They go, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to hit. What do we have to do to correct our vision and our dream to be able to hit that goal well we got to raise it at least two three inches wrong try 200 
And don't quote me on that. I don't have my dope charts in front of me, but it's, it's that area. It's that huge area of gap uh, that you're, you're, dropping, you're dropping feet, not inches. The church is in the same way. We are definitely going to hit exactly what we're aiming at. And if you're aiming at the wrong thing, a lot of times, and I'll say this, a lot of times the church is trying to aim at the right thing. Please hear me right. Oh, you might be like, you're just down on the church. No, I think the church is genuinely trying. I believe the little country church with 15 people in it praying for revival genuinely wants revival. But are they willing to get out of the seat and do what it requires to get revival? Because the thing that I'm going to just explain real quick, revival does not base on God. Revival bases on you. You might sit there and go, God, send a revival. I think God's sitting there saying, hey, spark a revival. The fuel's there. My presence is there. The anointing's there. You go start the fire. If you don't start the fire, it won't burn. We want God to hijack our service. You want to know what I want? I want us to hijack our service for the first time being spirit-led and actually do what God wants us to do. Because if that were to happen, breakthrough will happen. It has to. If we were to sit there and say, I'm an anointed man of God, I've been given dominion on this earth, I am called by the Almighty to shine his light, and I'm going to step forward into the authority that I've been given by the Almighty, and guess what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the church. But instead what the church has done is said this, oh, I'm not allowed to talk about politics because I might lose my 501c3. Oh, okay, okay. And what do we do? We become subservient. Oh, we can't do this because fill in the blank. Oh, okay. And we become subservient. And the enemy sits there and goes, ha, that was easy. I can take away the authority of the church by simply passing a law. I can take away. You want to know, let's just real quick establish something. The church was designed in this nation to be the voice of truth in every area of life. Right? Because listen, if, 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 if there are men and women of God that are called to be authoritative aspects of change, they're listening to the voice of God. They have an ear to heaven and an ear to earth. And when, whenever the world's like, I just don't know about this, and they go back to the house of God and say, guess what? We're not sure about this. What does God say about this? What does God say about this? Then all of a sudden, truth can come, Right? And it goes further. It actually goes to this. The government should be contacting the church Amen. and saying, hey, what's the next step? Right. And it's beginning to happen, you guys. There are godly men and women that are in political positions that are seeking out prophetic individuals and saying, you know what? I want you to be an advisor on my board because I need prophets and prophetesses that are going to walk in the calling that they have. And they're going to help lead this nation into greatness instead of into death. Because I'm going to tell you right now, guys, we're standing on a pendulum as a nation. If we don't do something incredibly quick, we won't have a nation that is going to be great much longer. And I'd even go as far as to say this, is our nation great even now? Because we, we kill babies by the millions. We say that sin isn't sin. We'll, we'll actually pour money into it even. And you know what? I, I know you're like, man, you're getting Facebook Live. Yeah. And, and honestly, I don't care. Because, because, you guys, we need to start realizing the goal of the church needs to start changing again. Right. If, the, if, if the church closes its doors tomorrow, I, this, is my, this is my prognosis. If the church closes its doors tomorrow, as a whole, this nation wouldn't miss it that much. And our goal should be a church that if the doors were to close, this nation would go into turmoil instantly. Because they would sit there and go, where are the men and women of God? Where are my voices? Where are those people who say, I'm not going to sit idly by and take nothing any longer? Where are they? A church without a vision is never going to grow, and a church's vision will never be larger than the vision of its leadership. The person with vision in a building, in a, in a congregation, in a church, will be the leader in that church. Uh, I'm very much driven towards vision. Uh, some people are, like, uh, annoyed by that even a little bit because I'm just like... Let's go. People are like, wait, wait a second. Do we, let's, let's not get that crazy. And, and honestly, I told my staff the other day this, um, and I'll tell you guys this. I don't need this job. I don't need this job. And that was a freedom moment for me because I was like, wait a second. You know how cool that is? 
You want to know how neat this is? No one can dictate the direction of this church except for God because your tithes don't. I don't need it. I can go get a job anywhere tomorrow. God placed me here for a specific purpose, and I truly believe the specific purpose that he placed me here is to ignite a fire that says, guess what? We're not going to be the same again. And if it's a deal where we, we sit there and go, God, we want to chart a new course as a church where you're the view, uh, future, you're the visionary of it, we're going to actually submit to you and say, God, I will take and I will fast and I will pray and I will do what it takes so I know your heart for this community. At that point, guess what? It all of a sudden turns into God's church and not your church and not my church. And you know, and if that, if that doesn't work, if we do not accomplish that and the doors of this church close in a year from now, guess what? At least we'd went down fighting. Because this is it. I would rather be a church that's on the edge of visionary than a church that's sitting directly in comfort doing absolutely nothing. If 10 years from now, this is what this church looks like, I will have failed as your pastor. If 10 years from now, this church completely recharts the course of Wheatland, then at that point, we're going to sit there and go, come on, somebody. If this church re- completely recharts the course of the state network, come on, right? If this church recourses the actual, when people, this is it, when, when we sit there and we have the, the nation as a whole look towards a little state of Wyoming that's the least populated in the union and says, we want what they've got. We want to know what's happening there. Guess what, guys? We're in a bu- budget deficit in the state of Wyoming. Did you know that? Massive budget deficit. They're going to have to raise taxes. It's not a good thing. What would happen if the church rose up, did its part? Men and women of God who are called to be businessmen and businesswomen did their part. How many, how many businesses are sitting in this place right now that are not yet done? That God put that fire in your heart and you just, you just quenched it because guess what? Being rich isn't part of God's plan. Come on. If God's called you to be a businessman or woman, why shouldn't you be the most influential and wealthy one in the world? If you're called to be not in the business realm, then you're going to fail in business and you're going to make money your God. But if God's called you to be dynamic and business minded, then be the big, big, biggest business this world's ever seen. Go for the top, above the top, p- bring people along on the way. And you know what? Whenever you're sitting down with Fortune 500 company owners and you're actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, when they said, you did this in two years, how? Well, let me tell you about my God. You did this how? Let me tell you about my God. Let me show you that there's a better way than the conniving and the scheming and the climbing that you had to do. There's a God that will take and open doors, that will close doors, that will, that will take and bring you and, and propel you into the future. You guys, this is the dream and the vision that is the church. This is what God was saying. And you might be like, I don't remember reading that in Scripture. Start looking at all the names. Who was Peter standing with, or who was Paul standing with when he wrote Romans? Look at that alone. Because every person that he was standing with short of about two slaves were influential people. Crazy influential people. Oh, they're not supposed to be part of the kingdom of God. Wait, what? Really? Because he was standing in a home writing that as Onesimus penned it. Onesimus the slave, another storm, another time. But that is an example right there of God not concerned about people's financial status. He's concerned about their hearts. Yes. Both ways. This is, I'm going to tell you right now, God would rather you live as a pauper right with him than a millionaire out of line with him. So just, I'm going to warn you, you keep your heart right on money, poverty mentality, but also greed, both of which will kill you. Whole nother sermon, whole nother time. Okay. So in many ways, I feel that God is beginning to download, beginning to give us a vision for our church. And this is the thing that I'm going to tell you. I don't believe the vision for our church is going to be the same vision for the next church. I believe aspects of it will certainly look alike. But this is the cool part about our God. If I were to sit there and say, hey, I wear a size 10 shoe, and this is going to fit every person in this place. You think? No. What did you say? Exactly. It's not going to fit, is it? No. So what if I were to sit there and say that I expect everyone to do what it takes to fit into this shoe? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So this is the thing. What if we were to sit there and say, God, what do you have for these people? What does that look like? Boom, he he caters it. It's custom built. What What does it look for these people? He caters it. It's custom built. You know, what does Guernsey need? Guernsey needs something different than Wheatland. It's got a different culture, different people. 
different dynamics. So God, start raising up the visionary leaders for Guernsey so we can plant that church. God, what does Chugwater need? Chugwater needs something different. It needs some help, right? I sit in political positions, and I understand that there's just some stuff in in Chugwater. So you know what? I want to bring people, godly men and women, that are going to go and loose the vision and the dream that is Chugwater. Do you see what I'm saying? God wants to build individual visions for our churches, for the church here at Impact, for the church in Cheyenne and Casper and Gillette and, and Douglas. Those churches, God wants to start growing a new vision for. A church will never outgrow its vision, and the vision of the church will now grow over the vision of the pastor. That's so true, you guys. So I want to challenge you to dream great dreams for God again. And this is the thing you might be like, oh, this is all on the leadership. Yes and no. It is in the fact that God's given the authority and the position of authority to me. But this is the thing. How many people know that wisdom is found in the counsel of many? The other thing is this. How many people know that you have the same Holy Spirit I have? There's no junior Holy Spirit. There's no, uh, there's no lack of education Holy Spirit and the educated Holy Spirit. There's no, you want to know, I'll tell you right now, I'll take, I will take a new believer that reads the word of God simply with no filter besides the Holy Spirit any day over a doctor of theology who's gotten jacked. Right? Because what happens is this. Someone knows all the right words to say, and someone says all the wrong things, but they're all right because he hasn't actually gotten tainted by somebody else. I read that and go, wow, that's what it's supposed to be like. I love watching new believers get hooked on the word of God and and then ask the Holy Spirit to to actually give it to them. If you have your scriptures, turn to Ephesians 3.16. Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, little book. But if you can find the three, you've got it. Andrew, could I have a cup of water, please? Thank you, brother. So three, starting in verse 16. So this is a prayer for the Ephesians is the title. And it's, it, I'm, I'm not going to start all the way at 14, which is the break. Um, obviously, we know that scriptural uh, verses and uh, chapters are man-made, not God-made. Do you understand that? So it doesn't mean we have to start exactly there. But the new concept that I want to talk about starts in verse 16. And if you have it, say, I got it. If you don't, look at your neighbor's Bible. <laughs> I pray that out of his, who's his? God's glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Okay, let's say that again. I pray that out of his, God's glorious riches, God may strengthen you. Who's you? Us, the Ephesian church, which we can put ourselves directly into that position. Us, that he may strengthen us, right? With what? Power, thank you, brother. Power from the Holy Spirit. How many people know this, that a lot of people are way more concerned about what man thinks than what the Holy Spirit says? Right? Sometimes, I'll I'll tell you right now, sometimes the Holy Spirit gives you things that you're like, that won't be popular, God. (laughs) Seriously. There have been some times where I'm like, I've ran a past glory, I'm like, this is what God told me. (laughs) And she's like, you better be obedient. I'm like, I know, that's scary. So that you, you may have power through the spirit in your inner being. What's our inner being? Let's talk about that for one second, then we'll move on. What's our inner being? Our spirit. Okay. So a lot of times the church has been guilty of being so physical. We look at the physical, we don't look at the spiritual. The spiritual is scary. It's, I mean, like, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of churches who I, I literally, it was the best thing ever. I was a pastor who told me this a while back. He said, I had, a, I had a nine-year-old little girl come up to me from their Sunday school class and said, Pastor, why do you always preach on God the Father, God the Son, but you won't even mention the Holy Spirit? And it, it wrecked his church, literally. Like, he had people leave his church because he did a series on the Holy Spirit. And he actually called me up and he's like, what do I do about this? And I'm like, well, you probably ought to read the scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. <laughs> but, but he got enough, enough flack that he stepped away. 
and said, no, okay, you're right. We'll just talk about God the Father and God the Son still. The Holy Spirit's real, you guys. Yeah, can it be something we don't understand? Sure, but that's cool. Because if you don't, under, if you don't fully understand God, then you're standing in a great place. Because the moment you feel like you fully understand who God is, then you're stuck. Because yep. you've, you've already put him in a box too small uh, for even your brain to comprehend. So don't even go there, okay? So in your inner being, in our spirit, we may be strengthened with power through the spirit in our spirit, in the inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Faith. Faith Faith works. We talked about that in our deeper study last week. Faith. You guys, faith is so incredibly important. We saw that in Hebrews 11, that the hall of faith. Faith is our, it's the currency, if you want to call that, to get in. Because God's saying, hey, you know what? I know this is not going to be popular. Have faith. God, I know this isn't exactly something that makes sense. Have faith. And the cool part that I've seen in faith in my life is whenever I step out in faith, God then reveals himself through his works. Let me say that again. I have found in my life when I step out in faith, he then reveals himself to me in his works. So I've been, there's been times where I'm like, God, I just don't know if you're behind this but I'm going to be obedient because I know you're calling me to this and I step into it and the doors open. Only God could open those doors. They boom, they open. So faith. Okay. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, it's always there. If we can't love people, then we're nothing. This weekend, um, there was the, the, the speaker, the keynote speaker for the conference, the youth conference. We just got back from a youth conference, if you didn't know that, yesterday afternoon. And um, he said this, um, Dylan is his name, uh, McKeeley. He misses you. Um, but he said this, he goes, I'm so sick and tired of seeing the giftings of the spirit being elevated when the fruits of the spirit are being destroyed. We want the giftings of the Spirit. Man, I just want to be able to prophesy, and I want to give words of wisdom and words of knowledge. But you know what? Get out of my way, kid. Most dynamic prophet that ever walked the earth was Jesus Christ, and he would sit there and go, you know what? Don't forbid them, because thus is the kingdom of God. If we don't have the gifts of the Spirit, guess what? You know the funnest part? I can't judge you, but I can fruit inspect you. God gave us that ability. I can sit there and say, by your fruit, I know that what you preach isn't truth in your life. You don't have time for the least of these. Guess what? You're not like Jesus. And we're all called to be like Jesus. So if you can't worry about the little old lady across the street because you're way more concerned about the evangelist that you actually has a name, guess what? Shame on you. I'm, I'm going to straight up be honest on this one because this one drives me nuts. There are people who will walk right past someone desperately needing a word from God and they'll walk up to the preacher and say, guess what? I want to take it. I want to be with his like because he's got influence. I'm going to just give you guys a, a tidbit and a, and a key here. You will find influence and gain influence the moment you realize that God cares about everyone. And, that, and I'm even going to go a step further because he said this, the, the, the sick need a doctor, not the well. And, and you know what? It's, it's way more important to go after the one, that concept. So, um, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, the love is the key, may have power together with all the what? All the saints. All the saints. This is not singular. We are not supposed to do this on our own. Let me talk about church for a second. A lot of people don't see the importance of coming to a, your organized fellowship of believers. And I'm going to tell you right now, you want to make me mad, that'll do it. I will get undignified on you because this is the best part about it. Now, I'm not saying this format is exactly what it's going to have to look like. That's, that's up for grabs tonight. But this is what I will say is if we are not coming together and 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 meeting together as a corporate body of believers with a goal in mind, how do you collaborate? How do you build? Can you have, can you have church on Monday? Yes, but that, that's different than coming together and meeting as the body of Christ to go forward into the mission. We collectively can come together and people can add in and build and we can build this beautiful picture of what church was meant to look like. So 
So this way you can have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, how many people here want all the fullness of God? That's kind of like, um, how many people would rather have a, uh, like a 1.6 cylinder four banger in their truck or a 400 horse 67 diesel, right? I mean, the fullness of God is the diesel, right? I'm, strike that. I'm not saying it's, you get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. So the thing that I also want to talk about, why do we have power all together with the saints? To grasp. The saints are required to grasp how what? How wide? How long? How high? And how deep is the love of Christ? And this is the way you do it. Let me tell you what God did this week. Do you get what I'm saying? The word of our testimony. Whenever we start sitting there and we come together as a church and go, guess what, guys? There's only one house left on my street that doesn't know God. Guess what, guys? There's no one left in the school. I don't, I'm running out of people. Guess what, guys? Let me tell you about when, when we were in the commons and someone got their leg healed. Like, it, it grew back. I mean, this kid was like, no leg, now he's got a leg. Guess what, guys? The school had to make their own little room for all the wheelchairs and, and, and the braces and the prosthetics because they can't quite figure out what God's doing. But guess what, guys? It's real. What happens when you walk into a powerhouse and we start seeing supernatural things happen? We start seeing electricity that's not being produced by a generator. Do you get what I'm saying, you guys? That's what the church is made to do. It isn't to come here like literally dragging through the door, hoping you can make it. It's to come here already electrified by a week of being the hands and feet of Jesus. And you walk in and say, guess what? This is a cool story. We were at church for nine hours that day because there were too many God stories from that week. Well, we do nine services now because we just can't fit everyone in one service. But guess what? We're building the building quick. Do you see what I'm saying? You guys, a lot of people gave me a lot of crud when I said we're going to build a thousand person church. They're like, there's no need for a thousand person church in Wheatland. I said, you're right. There's probably need for a 3,000 person church in Wheatland, but we don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough ability to, to make that happen right out of the gate. So we'll do three services. Is anyone hearing this? Because if we can do this, you guys, this is the thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ isn't broken. So let's actually start showing the gospel of Jesus Christ through our lives to a lost and dying world so that the church quits being just the club everyone goes to and it starts becoming the place where people go to to brag on what God did in their life that week. Where we can disciple new believers up. We can give them that three-year window where they're truly fully equipped to go out and start another church. You know what? This is the thing. They're talking about church planning in the state of Wyoming through the AG. And they're like, if we could have this many or this many, I said, there's 175, no, 195 zip codes in the state of Wyoming. Why can't there be 195 churches? And it actually should be quite a bit higher because this is my opinion. Casper should have 10, 15, 20. I mean, Cheyenne should have 15, 20. Laramie should have four or five. And you want to know something? We would never step on any other pastor's toes or church's toes because there's that many lost people going to hell. Twenty says this. Now to him who is able to do and, and say it with me, immeasurably more. What's immeasurably mean? It can't be measured. There is no number we can put on it. If I were to sit there and say, God, I need a million dollars, he's like, I'm gonna give you something that you can't even comprehend. It's gonna it's not gonna have a number to it. That's what I'm gonna do. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or Imagine. Dream. All that we can dream, he can do way more than that. When was the last time you actually had God dreams? This is the thing, and let me say it this way. It's not a God dream if you can accomplish it. It's not a God dream if you can accomplish it. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all you can dream, all you can imagine, all you can think up, according to whose power? Mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just establish something very quick that is so important here. 
and, and, I, and I bring this in because I think people's, the human nature inside of us has a tendency to botch this one. But if I were to sit there and say, Brian, the greatness I see in you, when I, when I go into that, this is, this is the beauty. Because of what Jesus did in his life, supernatural things happened. The greatness inside of us is God, you guys. Yeah. This is the thing. You could turn around. Let's look, at the, let's look at the Tower of Babel for one second. We're not reading that scripture. I'm just going to explain something. Man got it in their brain. They could be big as God. And you know what God did? <laughs> I don't really care for your language. I mean, do you see where I'm coming from, you guys? God places, when, you, when he was created in his mother's room, he, he came out of that womb with greatness. He did, because God created him that way. Now, he could turn around and he could get to the point where he's like, look who I am, and God could say, I will humble you. Nebuchadnezzar ate grass like an ox because he looked at himself and said, I'm pretty great. And God says, no, I'm pretty great, and you're going to look like an animal. This is the thing you guys have to understand. We eliminate the power of God from the equation. We eliminate the equation. The church is worthless without the power of God. And I'll go as far as to say this. The church is handcuffed and not able to do its calling without the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of churches trying and failing. And in ways, we've been that church in, in the past as well. So according to the power that is in work at work within us. So if God were to come along and say this, think of the biggest thing you can think I can do in your life, in your ministry, in your church, and guess what? I can top it higher than you could ever even imagine. Go, I mean, set the mark as high as you can physically set it. And God says, guess what? That's pretty low. But this is the thing that I find really interesting, going back to the Mark, uh, or the, not Mark Batterson, um, Rick Warren, uh, research poll that they did about churches and its growth curves. Um, churches without vision statements clearly spoken will never grow. It's in our human nature. How many people know that uh, Adolf Hitler was an amazing leader? He was a jacked up, whacked up man, but he was an amazing leader. You want to know how he could get people to drink the Kool-Aid? Because he was dynamic. Because he was given greatness by God that he did not walk into. Karl Marx, same thing. Mao Zedong, same thing. I mean, God placed the greatness inside of them. And what they did is they used it for the world. They used it for the enemy, not for God. Right? I mean, it's huge, you guys. You know, God is sitting there going, you know what? There, it's out there. So let me ask a question. What would you attempt for God if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you do for the king of the universe if you knew failure was not going to happen? Because I'll be honest with you. You want to know what keeps us from dreaming? Two things. Fear. What would you say? Comfortability. Comfortability. What I put down on here was the fear of what other people will say about me. Expectation. Because this is it. How dare you, Jeremy? How dare you? You're only from Wheatland. Everything I'm saying, you guys have been told me. Quit, quit it, Jeremy. There's no way. Hmm. You're right. And there's really no way that God could take a mechanic welder and clean him up enough to put him into a, p a position of a pastor. I'm not saying he cleaned me up all that much yet. I'm still working on that. <laughs> but do you get what I'm saying, you guys? So fear of what other people think and the understanding or the concept that we don't think God's big enough. Oh, he went there. Oh, I did go there. Because this is it. Oh, God, he's all powerful. He's almighty. But we've always put limits on him. Yeah. So a lot of times I pray when I go into places, God, show off here. I wanted to see you show off once. Could you imagine what God showing off would look like? <laughs> God, we need to build a new church building. Okay, I'm going uh, to dump 45 pounds of diamonds into your church. Yeah. In a church service. In, 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 a, in a worship service. Is God capable? Yeah. yeah. Totally. Am I saying that's how we're going to fund the church? I don't know. God didn't tell me that. But do you get what I'm saying, you guys? We put a limit on God. So the two things, fear and our limit on God. So what happens if we dreamed in such a way? What if we 
attempted to do something that we knew that it could not fail because our God was behind it. Let me say this. If it's not of God, don't try that, though, because it will fail. Let that concept expand your horizons. So let it expand your dreaming, expand your vision. But you have to understand it starts with a dream. What about the scriptures like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? <laughs> oh, that's talking about sin and not sinning. Oh, really? Well, that's interesting. You want to know how much time God spent on telling you not to sin in scripture? Very little. You want to know how much time he spent on telling you how to live? A lot. But the focus was never on sin. The woman caught in sin, he didn't le- read off the, the, the roll to her. The woman at the well, he didn't go after her either. He didn't go after Zacchaeus. Well, I've done a lot of bad things. You know what? God didn't even ask him to pay back the people he robbed. He did. Why? Because God's not sitting there going, Mark, I know about your life. And I just don't know. I mean, I want to use you, but we got to get some stuff cleaned up first. You know the best part about it? He uses people despite their jacked up situation. Isn't that cool? God's like, you know what? You've arrived. Let's go. Well, I've got a lot of sin issues. I know we'll take care of them along the way. I'll scrub as we run, right? But a lot of times what we do is we sit here and we scrape our wounds with the pot shards and sit there and go, woe is me. I'm a sinner. And God's saying, you're right. You are. But you can come into righteousness. I've given you that freedom. It's hard to scrape your wounds whenever you're working. So three things. First of all, there are three parts to getting God's vision. The first is this, what? What is God's vision? That's what we're doing tonight. The first thing God shows you is the what. He shows you what he's going to do through you. This requires prayer and fasting. I'm going to tell you right now, I love food. And if you ever think of that, it's going to be fun to go on a youth convention where everyone around you is eating all the time, and it's good food. I'm just saying. Uh, That's hard. And then ice skating and taking trussing down and all of those things while not having food is hard. Um, But you know something I found out of this? It's something I should do way more of. I'm not saying that I'm enjoying it. Please hear me right. (laughs) But we should do it more of it because there's a clarity that comes. When you get rid of the crap, and, and this is the thing, our belly is probably one of our biggest idols, guys. I mean, you want to know what dictates us? I can go for an entire day and not have a single God thought. And at the end of the day, I go, huh, I'm a little in the funk. I go a day without food, and I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm sitting there going, like, tofu sounds healthy right now and great. <laughs> right? I mean, I... Lori told me, she goes, when you get done with this, because I'm like, what should I eat for my first meal? She goes, I don't think you'll care. (laughs) But so often we do that in our walks with God where we're like, you know, we kind of abandoned you today. Yeah, maybe it kind of unraveled. Ah, we're good. I want it to be a situation where I feel my hunger for God is like my hunger for food. Where I sit there and go, you know what, God, I've gone four hours without you having an encounter with you. And it's, it's not just without him, because you're never without him, but it's an encounter with him. I've gone four hours without an encounter with you. And God, I need more of you. This isn't enough anymore. Because I need every, you know what, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to turn into a snacker. And you know what, God, I'm going to take and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the bathroom and, and I'm going to get on my knees in that stall and I'm going to cry out to my king because he's worthy of it. I'm going to sit there and you know what, I'm going to say, God, you know what, it's been at least a day since you've given me something dynamic from you and I'm hungry for it. Yeah. Dreaming, it starts with the what. God, what are you going to do? And this is the thing I'm going to tell you with confidence. This isn't my job alone. This is all of our job as the body of Christ to come here tonight and say, guess what, we're going to make a list and then we're going to seek the face and we're going to come at five and we're going to continue to fast and we're going to continue to pray and worship and we're going to say, God, what do you want? Oh, we're going to look at 14 self-help books on how to grow past the 200 mark. No, no, because guess what, I'm going to tell you something very confidently. If God shows up and does what he wants, we're going to be the one on the downhill side running after God, what are we going to do with 45 more kids in kids' ministry, Charity? What are we going to do? What are we going to do with another 150 people that are here at church? Okay, guys, Saturday night service, that's what we're going to roll with. 
Oh my goodness, we don't have room for this anymore. Two Sundays, three Sundays, two Saturdays. Oh God, we got to get a building quick, built quick. <laughs> Do you see the difference? We've got a building plan on that wall and it is sitting in a stagnant pause state. And I say, God, why isn't that moving? And he said this, he goes, because if you went into that building with your vision, you'd kill it. And he says, so gain my vision and then build a building. God will not release the finances to build the dream until we actually have his dream. So after what, it's how. So real quick, the what. If we try it on our own, it'll fail. Don't know that. So the what isn't our what, it's God's what. The second is how. How is, it going to, how is, how is God going to do it? When God shows you how, it always seems to be the opposite way of what you thought. And once you see the what and the how, there's still a third part. That's the when. So the how, God will give us things that we're going to be like, no way. Really? And we're going to wake up and go, wow. Because it happened. The when. How many people know that God's timetable stinks? Everyone's like, oh, you can't say that. I can say that because my flesh doesn't like his timetables. But you want to know something I know know of God? God never doesn't show up. When God says, I'll be there, he's sitting there going, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, go. Because in this moment, if I show up right out of the gate, they're going to become comfortable. If I show up late, they'll lose heart. But when I show up perfect all of a sudden the things of God become so much more important than their things. Real quick, go back to Ephesians 10. We're going to backtrack just a little bit and grab this verse as we close. Ephesians 3.10, yes, sorry. 3.10, you're like, we were in 3, we're going back to 10, doesn't work. Guys, I'm not sleeping and I'm not eating, okay? Okay, you guys, this is just good verses. Ephesians 3.10 says this. His intent, whose intent? It's got an uppercase, okay. It's also at the beginning of a uh, sentence, so it better have an uppercase. Um, <laughs> his intent was that now, everyone say now. now. Why would there be a now? now? Because it didn't exist before. So his intent was that now through the church, everyone say church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Wait a second. Let's just go there. So if the rulers in the heavenly realms, does that mean DC? No. So who are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Angels, strongman, it's demonic, angelic, it's all of the spiritual hierarchy. So we've got archangels, we've got, we've got d- all sorts of different rankings. It's a kingdom, you guys. So there's going to be rankings in the kingdom, right? So we've got this thing that's so cool. The church was given the directive now, the manifold wisdom of God, not knowledge, wisdom. And this is a whole, we're not, we don't have time to cut this up like we should. And I've not fully gotten revelation on this like I should probably. But the, the thing, okay, so let me find my place again. Now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. You know what that tells me? Angels should be standing here waiting to hear God's voice out of our mouth. Oh, yes. What would happen if that were the case, if the angels were like, did you guys know that? What would happen if the, if the demonics said, crap, That's right. they know that now? Or further yet, we didn't know that, and that means a serious dent in our kingdom. Do you guys get what I'm going after? God is calling the church to so many dynamic things. Why am I throwing teasers in there? Because I want you thinking this afternoon. I want you guys coming here hungry tonight at 5 o'clock or at 6.30. I understand if you've if you got a busy afternoon and your football team's playing. Um, 
but we're going to sit here and worship. There's not going to be anything organized. Uh, we're going to just, the team's going to take the stage, some parts, pieces. I don't know what it looks like. And they're going to start praying, and we're going to sit there, and we're just going to say, God, you know what? Let this atmosphere represent that of heaven. Yeah. Where uh, the filament of heaven rips in this joint. Where we sit there and go, okay, God, we want to hear your voice, and it's a lot easier to hear your voice because all the distractions and all of the things are gone. So I'm going to just say right now, your job for this evening is this, scrub yourself. Scrub yourself spiritually. Sit there and go, okay, God, is there any wicked way inside of me? You know, this is it. A lot of people are like, oh, we're, we're not going to focus on sin because sin. How many people know that we have to confess our sins one to another and to God? That's scriptural. That's biblical. You want to know something? Sin still will drive a wedge. It doesn't separate you, but you cannot have right relationship in sin. Know the difference? Sin doesn't separate you from the love of God, but sin will take and it will hijack your communion with God because he is a sovereign God that is jealous and has no others that he will stand next to. So if lust is your God, God will not come into a place with you of open communication unless it's correction. People don't like that one. Okay. Thank you. It is really good. So real quick, a couple things, and you don't have to turn here. I'm just going to hammer this because my kid leaders in back are like, what? Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3 says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower. This is Habakkuk speaking. And I will look out to see what he is saying to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And this is what God said. The Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it for still the vision awaits its appointed time. Still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It may seem slow, but wait for it. It will surely come and it will not delay. You want to know the difference between then and now? I wear tennis shoes and they didn't. Nothing. You guys, it's, it's, it's the heart of the father. This is the cool part about it. The heart of the father it runs through the thread of history. And the heart of the Father is that he will take and, and we need to write down the God vision, right? Write it down. Stop. Don't do anything. Write it down. Don't miss it. Write it down. Why? So that everyone knows it. So everyone can see it. Why is it? Because we still wait. The vision awaits its appointed time. It's come. We know what it is. Now we went from the what to the When? When, God? When is it going to be? You know something? This has been brewing inside of us for a long time, but God finally gave us freedom three weeks ago to go there. We got to walk through the door and say, guess what? The church is ready. The community may not be ready, but that's okay. We're going to go there now. Oh, we're going to get freaky. No, actually, if anything, this is going to get way less freaky. Because it's going to strip and it's going to, we're going to decay all of the, the, the freaky traditions of men. And we're going to just see this beautiful manifestation of what God intended that is going to be based in what? Love. You want to know, I'm giving you a teaser tonight to what God's giving me. You haven't started loving anyone until you start coming tonight and realize what love looks like. But we got to talk about that because we're closing. And and as we close, is Shirley still here?